in the final uh, lesson, from my perspective anyway, uh, looking at Hezekiah's extra 15 years of life, I wanted to take a short stroll through its perhaps imaginary, but uh, nonetheless, the tour that Hezekiah did not give. <laughs> um, I say perhaps imaginary because what we're talking about is that Babylon sent envoys to him to learn why he had been or how he had been healed from that mortal illness that he had. And um, he showed them the wrong things. So I wanted to look at what, you know, what could have been done and would have been better and the ramifications of those things, which I think are thoroughly scriptural. I guess uh, you'll read them with me and see what you think about that. But that's what we're looking for because uh, we're still in the theme of created in him for good works. So we're intended to be active. We're intended to be doing. And at this time of life, Hezekiah was lifted up with pride and was not doing what he had done before. So what, you know, what it comes down to again is that he had a terminal illness, we were told, and he was told through the prophet that he would die of this. And he prayed earnestly to the Lord who listened to his prayer and answered his prayer and granted him another 15 years of life and a miracle to back it up with. And this became known not just in Israel, but in other nations, including the faraway nation of Babylon, who sent messengers to him to learn about this. And our lesson is focused on what he, what he told them um, as much as what he didn't tell them. So we start over in uh, Second, uh, Second Chronicles 32. We're looking specifically at verse 25. For the first one. This is the one that says Hezekiah did not make return according to the benefit done to him because his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came upon him and Judah and Jerusalem, which is to say that is why wrath came. But what it says is he made no good return because his heart was proud. It's a heart matter that is affecting whether or not he is doing what God wants, whether he is productive in the Lord. It comes from the heart. And so one of the things that we know is happening since Chronicles tells us this is what's really going on. This is the mechanism underlying his actions. We know that when the envoys came and wanted to know how he was healed, he was being informed by his pride rather than by his faith. He wasn't speaking from his faith in God. And he wasn't acting from his faith in God. He was speaking from the pride of his heart and acting from the pride of his heart. This thing that he did, it was not from faith, which is, of course, sin. And Isaiah 39 is the next passage here, but Isaiah, the, the prophet, is the one that records the the most information about this visit from the Babylonian envoys. And if we look at it in the first couple of verses to begin with, the king of Babylon sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he had heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah welcomed them gladly, And he showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his whole armory, all that was found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. That's the record of Isaiah 39, verses 1 and 2. And we focus again on the first verse that 
the king of Babylon heard about Hezekiah's healing. He had been sick, and he recovered too. And so because of this, he sends envoys. What this means is he wants to know what happened. How did this happen? Because that guy was going to die, and we all knew he was going to die, and we were waiting for that. <laughs> but now he's alive, and we're going to have to go figure out what happened here. Right, so they're asking is what this means. And the fact is, what is recorded for us is he showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his whole armory, all that was found in the storehouses. This is answering incorrectly, isn't it? They came to find out how he had been healed, and he shows them everything that he has, his wealth that he has amassed, and the public works that he has done. You see what he did not do? He showed them the tour that he did give was the treasure, the armory, the storehouses. And the treasure makes perfect sense. That's money. Everybody loves that. Whole armory, meaning the, his military power, and the storehouses, meaning their supply, their, their crops, their supply, their future, if you will. So it's all about having, you know, what they think that they need to be a power on earth, to be self-sufficient, to be independent, to be strong. But you see what he did not do. They came because they heard he had been healed. See what he didn't do? He did not tell them about the works he had done that led to him being healed. The reason for which he was healed, he did not give. This is the wrong answer. Even though it's earthly and envoys who come, you know, expect to get this kind of a tour because these are the things that kingdoms, you know, think that they're made out of, think that this is how it runs, this is how it works. But they're missing that this is the kingdom of Israel. It's a spiritual kingdom, and God is its king. And they're not run by the numbers. In fact, they're forbidden to number the people, remember? <laughs> Why didn't he tell them about that? Well, if we go back to Second Kings, it's chapter 20 which reveals why this was done. It was in those days, after they repelled Assyria, that Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, son of Amos, came to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, you shall die, you shall not recover. And Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Now, Lord, please remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. What he says here is accurate in the third verse. Remember, Lord, how I've walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. This is accurate. And this is his prayer. In fact, it's the entirety of the prayer as it is recorded. So it is the reason for which God healed him. Clearly, God agreed. He had done good things. He had walked faithfully with a whole heart. And so it was worth investing in him. Remember what he had done? We talked about this in earlier lessons, but um, Hezekiah, first thing that he did was to repair the doors of the temple, clean the trash out of the temple, reopen it so they could worship there again, reestablish the service of the Levites and of um, the priests and the sacrifices and offerings that were to be made. They observed a Passover there like it hadn't been done since 
you know, Solomon and David. And, you know, this is not a small thing. I mean, even when he did that, he invited the tribes of Israel who were left, who you know whoever was still there that actually worshiped the Lord after Assyria carried the majority of them off in captivity. He reached out to them. And some of them came, some of them mocked, but some of them did come. And in some sense, the kingdom is united under Hezekiah in the faith of God, the, the Lord God of Israel, the real God. And that assembly, you may recall, that came together to observe the Passover, went straight away from there back to their respective homes uh, or cities and destroyed all the high places there. So they left with a genuine dedication to the Lord with a faithfulness. You know, what Hezekiah did there was to turn the clock back centuries. They went back to a time where the kingdom is united in, some, in, in the spiritual and the high places that Solomon had introduced were taken out. So, you know, the question, the question that I would pose is, aren't those things greater things than the treasure house, the armory, the storehouses? Aren't the, you know, isn't the reestablishment of the temple, the reestablishment of the worship of the Lord, the observance of the Passover, the reunification of the spiritual kingdom Israel, isn't that greater and better than a treasury, an armory, a storehouse? Aren't these the things that he did, that he, ref that he referred to um, at 2 Kings 20 and verse 3 as walking before God in faithfulness with a whole heart? These are the works that he did. That's the reason for which he was healed. That was his prayer, and God answered that prayer. It was true. And isn't the way that Hezekiah was healed the thing that those envoys wanted to know? Isn't that why they were sent from Babylon? It's said in Isaiah 39 that the king sent these messengers, dispatched these messengers to him, on hearing that he had been sick and had recovered. He knew there, there was a miracle. Or at the very least, he knew that something nobody expected happened. So if these are the better works, and if they are the real reason for which he had been healed, and they wanted to know why he had been healed, you know, the question is, why then did he tell them about the treasure house, the armory and the storehouses, and not about the things that he did that actually brought about his healing? Well, Chronicles told us, because his heart was proud. He had become proud, and the, and the pride blinded him. See, before this, Assyria attacked them, which you may recall. We're going back to 2 Chronicles. But yeah, before this, that we're reading, uh, you know, before the visit, I guess, from the Assyrian envoys, we read of an attack on Judah by Assyria. And this is a serious problem because, well, Assyria is a world power. They're conquering everything they come into contact with because God anointed them to go out conquering, but not to take Judah. They were not supposed to come against Judah. They disobeyed the Lord by going against Judah. But it's also a serious threat because it was the will of the Lord that they take Israel, and they did. The time that Assyria comes knocking at Hezekiah's door in Judah, Assyria, some years, a short number of years earlier, had just done this to Israel. They besieged it. They took it. They killed, you know, everybody of fighting age. They took 
all the rest of them slaves. You know, that's, that's a standard operating procedure. So when they showed up, they were a serious threat, weren't they? That's the idea. But at this time, he was still walking in the faith, and he was still doing what God wanted. So he answered Assyria quite well. I think it's interesting that Assyria came posing a direct threat, having already succeeded in wreaking havoc with their neighbors. And he stood against them and stood up and did what was right, relied on the Lord his God, and the people were delivered. That's interesting. Where, on the other hand, Babylon comes knocking, but it doesn't look like a threat. It looks like they're visiting and they're interested in his welfare. And that one got him. That's interesting. When he realizes there's a real threat, he relies on the Lord. When he thinks there's no threat or he thinks, I got this, that's when he falls. That's interesting. But it's true, Assyria came, and when they came, they said a bunch of things that are not true. They accused Hezekiah of destroying the worship of the Lord, which is not true. And they took, basically, the Israel position, the divided kingdom position. They were informed by Israel, the slaves of Israel they had taken. And everything that Hezekiah actually had done right, they think, is wrong. And that's what Assyria did. That's what they talked about when they showed up. It's recorded there in 2 Chronicles 32. It's verses 10 to 15, which is a lot. But take a look with me. Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria. Oh, okay. Am I supposed to care about that? <laughs> you know what I care about? Thus says the Lord. That's what I care about. Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria. Yeah, I don't care. On what are you trusting that you endure the siege of Jerusalem? Isn't Hezekiah misleading you so that he may give you over to die by famine and by thirst when he tells you the Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? Yeah, on what are you trusting? Hezekiah is misleading you. He thinks the Lord will deliver you. If you think that, you're being misled. What are you trusting? Do you trust Hezekiah? Do you trust Egypt? You know, you think you have somebody else in your pocket that's going to back you up? Well, the answer to that, of course, is they trust in the Lord, God of Israel. Their military strategy was neither. <laughs> they trust in the Lord, and the Lord does deliver them. And it's always been that way. That's how Abraham made it, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and the patriarchs, and Moses, and the people when they walked out of Egypt across the Red Sea is on dry land. That was no strategy. That was no military. That was the Lord, God of Israel. And it always has been. What do you trust in? Hopefully, we don't trust in our own strength, our own abilities, um, you know, our alliances, our resources, like Hezekiah showed them all the resources on the side of the Babylonians. Hopefully, that's not where the trust is. No, we trust in the Lord, and that's well-placed. But this fool continues in the 12th verse, Hasn't the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, Before one altar you shall worship, on it you shall burn sacrifices? Hasn't Hezekiah taken away God's high places and altars? No, no, that's Jeroboam's false religion. That's the false religion of Jeroboam that he set up to keep the people from visiting Jerusalem to keep their hearts from turning back to the Lord. It was directly, purposefully set in place 
to prevent them from worshiping the Lord God. No, they weren't God's high places, although they said they were. They called them the places of the Lord. They worshiped the Lord at these high places, supposedly. It's not actually possible. Hasn't he commanded before one altar you shall worship? You see what that is? That's Jerusalem, and it's the Bible. That is what God commanded. <laughs> but it's not the religion of Jeroboam who set up multiple, or at least two that we know of, Dan and Bethel, but there were also high places and temples, multiple temples too. But, you know, Assyria sees that as, well, God was being served by this multiplicity of resources. Doesn't God want all these big numbers and all this convenience and all these people coming out? That's what people think. They think that's what serves God, but it's not. To heed is better than the fat of rams, right? Obedience is greater than rivers of oil. No, God is worshipped and God is served in the way that God specifies. Yeah, these guys have got it all wrong. In the 14th verse, he said, Who among all the gods of those nations that my... Oh, I'm sorry, 13. Don't you know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of other lands? Were the gods of the nations of those lands at all able to deliver their lands out of my hand? Who among all the gods of those nations my fathers devoted to destruction was able to deliver his people from my hand so that your God should be able to deliver you from my hand? Now, therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or mislead you in this fashion. Don't believe him, for no god of any nation or kingdom has been able to deliver his people from my hand or from the hand of my fathers. How much less will your god deliver you out of my hand? Yeah, who among all the gods was able to deliver his people? Well, those were not real gods. That was all fraudulent. No, that doesn't work. No, that doesn't save. No, it's not effective. There is no other God. This is the only God. This is the only place where the real God is being served. That's why you come here, because this is where God is served. It's the place to serve him. And there isn't another God. You, you can't worship God somewhere else. He is not being worshipped anywhere else. Pretty brazen to say, how much less will your God deliver you? Yeah, no, uh, he's different from all the others. You think it's no different. You think it's religion is just not real. What Assyria is doing, what Sennacherib is saying here, is the atheist argument. This, these religions are not real. Gods are not real. They don't deliver. They don't save. Which follows all the other things that people say, right? The leopard doesn't change his spots. People don't change very much. You know, all the things that they say are impossible, which are impossible with men. But with God, all things are possible. God raises the dead. But they don't believe that God is real. And there's a lot of confusion in the world. There's a lot of denominations in the world that say they believe in God, but they don't. They say they worship God, but they're not worshiping him. Admittedly, that could be confusing to somebody who's never really known what the Bible says. And they might look at that and say, well, that doesn't seem to make a difference in the lives of those people. Those people are not any different or better from anybody else. And that's true. They're not. Because they don't have the real God. They don't have the real power of the Word of God in their lives. But that's not the way it's supposed to be in the churches that belong to him. The fact is, in history, there have been a lot of foreigners recorded in Scripture that gave God the glory. So, you know, as we started out, um, the lesson I was talking about, well, maybe it's fanciful, maybe it's imaginary, but actually, it's well-founded 
And here's why I would say that. If you go, you know, we'll start in Joshua 2, but the fact is that there were examples um, in the history of the people before Hezekiah, and there's even examples after Hezekiah, where people who are not Israelites recognize God and recognize what God is doing and glorify Him. Why are we saying this? Well, because somebody might think, well, what's the point of telling Babylonian messengers about restoration of the temple, restoration of the sacrifices, observance of the Passover, reunification of the people, tearing down the high places? Why tell them about that? They won't understand. Well, they may not understand now, but they can. And they never will if we never explain it to them. You know, if they don't understand or, or they, they won't get it or they, they don't have any background, if that's a reason not to tell somebody about the works of God, then you'll never teach the lost. Nobody will hear about the gospel. That doesn't make any sense. We have to teach. We have to say something. They came there with a direct question to find out how this happened. He could have told them all about it. And it's nothing new. It's nothing novel. That's what we're getting at in this section. It's not new. It's not novel. There are plenty of examples of foreigners believing in God. Remember Joshua 2 with Rahab in the town of Jericho? Before, before the people took Jericho as the Lord gave Jericho into their hands, spies went in and they stayed at the house of Rahab. She hid them. She protected them. And they afterwards established a covenant with her and she came into um, the nation of Israel. In fact, she's in the genealogy of our Lord Jesus. But for the time before the people took Jericho, she said to the spies, I know that the Lord has given you the land. It's a done deal. I know the Lord has given you the land which is telling you something. If you were a Bible student, you know that Rahab now knows something that the rest of Israel hanging out back there waiting for the spies to return don't know. How do they not know this? It's so obvious if you're looking by faith. I know the Lord has given you the land. The fear of you has fallen on us. All the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. They got it, see? They can put two and two together. Everybody's afraid. We know what's happening. We have heard in the 10th verse how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. So they heard about the Red Sea, which has already been years ago. At the time that she's speaking, that was already years ago, but we heard about that Red Sea. We heard about what happened to the kings on the other side of the Jordan from here. We know what happened. And as soon as we heard it, the 11th verse continues, our hearts melted and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. Look at that proclamation. The Lord, your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath, said this prostitute from a Canaanite country. But she could see it. She could understand it. She could put two and two together. She came to believe in the Lord. She had faith. 
It's by faith that she was delivered, she and her family. She saved her household by her faith. Sounds familiar. But he, she's in Hebrews 11. But, you know, this is to say, um, this complete foreigner was capable of seeing and drawing the conclusion that's the real God. There is something different in Israel. Now, there's another reference over in 2 Kings in the fifth chapter where we, we read about a man named Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria. This is a very powerful man, but he has leprosy. He's a dead man because leprosy in those days, I don't know whether it still is today, but at those, in those days at least, leprosy was a death sentence. That's a terminal illness from which you do not recover. He was a leper. He was dying. The king of Syria sent him with a letter to the king of Israel to ask for healing at the insistence of a slave girl from Israel who said, there is a prophet in Israel who could heal my master Naaman. So they went. And Naaman goes and he sees, well, speaks to Elisha, although he doesn't actually speak to Elisha, speaks to a messenger of Elisha, but that's good enough because the power is not in Elisha, the power is in the word that he speaks, which is not his, it's God's. The message is the power, not the messenger. And the message is, dip in the Jordan seven times and you will be clean. Your flesh will be restored, which he eventually goes on to do. And it's true. He was restored, completely healed of this leprosy. A new man to live again. And he returns in the 15th verse, it's recorded of 2 Kings 5, to the man of God with all of his retinue. He came and stood before that prophet and said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. said the Syrian commander of the army. <laughs> there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. The prophet knew that there was value in giving him a message from God that would heal him, and he drew the right conclusion from that message and took it back with him to Syria. One supposes that when he got back to Syria and the king asked him, how were you healed? He did not show the king his treasury and his armor. And over in Daniel, chapter 4, there is even this fella who happens to be the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. who has been humbled by God, made to beg and wander in the wilderness. But when he comes to his senses, he writes this letter, which is captured for us in Daniel chapter 4. And in this letter, at verse 34, he said, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. So even the king of Babylon, the country that took Hezekiah's children, that took Judah into captivity, including Daniel, is now admitting, after being humbled, that the Lord, he is God. 35th verse, all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven 
and among the inhabitants of the earth. He does what he wants. Whether in heaven or on earth, it's God's will. God does his will, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Yeah, we don't get to cross-examine God. That's not how it works. Nebuchadnezzar knows that now. He didn't understand it before God humbled him, but now he gets it. And now he thinks it's so important that he writes a letter and causes it to be recorded. And in the 37th verse, he said, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. And I thought it was worth capturing that in its entirety. That verse, January 4, 37. He's Nebuchadnezzar. But praise and honor belong to the king of heaven. And those who walk in pride, God is able to humble. Which points right back at Hezekiah, whose heart was lifted up in pride. and thereby handed everything over to Babylon. So that's the tour that Hezekiah didn't give. See? He could have told them, well, this is what we did. We worshiped the Lord according to the commandment. We pulled out the book, and we read it, and we did what it said. He could have done this. There are many examples of people who are not Israelites understanding that message. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar's realization could have come sooner. Who knows? But you know, when you don't, you know, Nothing's going to happen. You don't speak the word. You don't take action on the word. Well, no action will be taken. Nothing will be done. Nothing will happen. No, no result will come. But we'll go to Hebrews chapter 4 to talk about obedience to the gospel because... There's a contrast there between Joshua in the promised land and Jesus today, where it's recorded in the 7th and 8th verses of Hebrews 4. Again, God appoints a certain day. It's called today. Today is the day of salvation. And he does this, you know, in a psalm by David, saying, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the day of the rebellion. But the certain day is today. Today is the appointed day of salvation. But he said, he says this, you know, the reason this is brought up centuries later is because if Joshua had given them rest, God wouldn't have spoken of another day later on. If Joshua leading them into the promised land had been everything God had in mind when it comes to today being the day of salvation, the, the rest for the people to enter, if that's what he had, mind, had in mind, there was no reason for David to say centuries later, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Why today? Well, it's today is the point. Today is salvation. Today is the day you can do something about. And Joshua did not give them rest. Jesus gives us rest. That's the point. And yet Joshua is Jesus, by the way. Those Joshua is the Hebrew version. Jesus is the Greek version, but it's the same name. They have the same name. Jesus' name is, is Joshua. But if that Joshua 
Back there in the book of Joshua had given them rest. There'd be no need of addressing a new day of salvation later on, centuries later. No, it's the Jesus of the New Testament who gives rest today. Are we perhaps speaking to some who are not yet Christians? Today is the day of salvation for you as well. If you have not put Jesus on in baptism for forgiveness of sins, if you've not repented and admitted that God is right, if you've not decided to live from, from henceforth for God, it's time to do so. Today is the day to do it. And you've seen in the scriptures how God preserved his people by means of their faith in him, their trust in him, which is well-placed against all odds. We'll be glad to help you to obey the gospel if that is your need. If today you are a Christian and have not lived right, repent. Let us pray with you so that we can also be strengthened by your resolve. If you need our prayers, you need to be baptized in the name of Christ Jesus. Please let your need be known now by coming to the front while together we stand and sing the song selected.